Good morning and welcome everybody. I am so excited to have you guys join us in Sunday School. In my last video, I explained why we're doing Sunday School by video. Because our live service is at 7.30 in the morning and I know that's early for some of you to attend. As I said before, you have children, you have to get up quite early. I would love nothing more than for you to be there, but I do understand. But I want to make Sunday School available to everybody. And I'm doing this by making these videos available to you. Now, I want to also make Sunday School interactive. In the future, we're going to be able to, you're going to be able to send me questions and we're going to be able to go back and forth on what it is we're reading and learning together. Because I want your experience to be a really, really good experience between you and the Lord and studying his word. So I'm going to make it interactive. I can't do it right now, but I'm working on that process. We're in the book of Acts in our live Sunday school class. That's where we are right now. We're in the eighth chapter. But I feel like I need to lay a foundation for all of our new guests. I need to just kind of give some biblical background that I want to be able to use in the future with you so your understanding would increase greatly. Because we assume that everybody un understands the Bible on the same level we do. And I want to avoid that. But before I do anything, we need to pray. So would you bow your heads with me and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, here's my hope and my expectation, Father, is that we can begin to interact together by video and Lord, together explore your word and Lord, have fun doing it. I pray, Lord, that your people will be able to sit at home at their leisure and begin to explore your truth, Lord, for their own lives. So God, help me to just offer them something that they could use in their own personal study of the Word of God. Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place to have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, I believe the Bible should be fun and exciting for every believer. I believe it should be fun to you, not a duty or a sense of obligation or something you have to do in order to feel good before God, even though you do want to feel good before God. But I want the Bible to be fun and exciting to you. But And let me give you four quick reasons why I think it's so important, so vital for every believer to read the Word of God and to have a knowledge and understanding of it. First of all, we need to know who God is. We need to know who our Heavenly Father is. Two, we need to know what pleases God. We need to understand that. And three, we need to know how to live holy. We need to know how to transition out of our old worldly way of life into the holiness of God by doing what is right and pleasing in his eyes. And four, we need to know about eternity. Hey, listen, that's something we got to know. Uh, there is an eternity out there and there are really only two places to spend it, but we'll deal with that later. Now, for those of you who have not been a part, that have been a part of our Sunday school, I'm going to ask you to do something. I need you to be a little patient with me because I want to go back and do some background or to lay a foundation for our new guests that join us. I want to lay a kind of a, set the table in a way, and I'm going to have to go back in time and study some things that I know you've already studied and I know you already know. And here's why I want to do it. I believe that we always think that people understand the Bible on the level that we do. We just assume that there are fundamental things that everybody knows. And that's not really true. So we have to we'll be willing to go back and kind of build the foundation again, the fundamentals of Scripture, so that everybody's brought up to speed. I'd rather assume that people are not fully aware of the things we're going to talk about. I'm just going to assume that even though they may understand it, I still want to give a little bit of a history and a biblical view from the beginning. I've always said to the class and those who attend know this, that the Bible is one book. It has many stories and many authors, but they all lead to the Messiah. There are two testaments, but still one book. I'm going to show you how that works in just a moment. So I want you to sit back, relax, open your Bible, and let's spend some valuable time together. Would you do that? Now, something happened 6,000 years ago. Depending on how you date, 
time or how you understand the history of man and the Bible. And we're going to talk about that later, but something happened 6,000 years ago. We'll talk about how uh, different people view the world from thousands of years and millions of years and billions of years. We'll talk about that in a minute. But I want to give you, uh, starting the idea that 6,000 years ago, something happened that changed everything that we're dealing with to this very day. Something happened in the Bible. Let's go back to the Garden of Eden. Let's do that. Let's go all the way back. A transgression occurred against the command of the Lord in the Garden of Eden. A transgression occurred, an act of rebellion against God's command. And this story we're going to pick up in Genesis chapter 2. So I want you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 2. And we're going to start reading in verse 15. But I want to set up a background and I want you to open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. We're going to go back in time, 6,000 years, and we're going to look at what happened that made our present reality what it is. Beginning in Genesis 2, verse 15, it says the Lord God, and he's already created man. It said the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to take care of it. And he said to the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will surely die. That command was given to Adam. And you might say, wow, such an easy command, a simple command to keep. But as we all know, in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve failed miserably. They failed the test. Now, we're going to skip over to Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to look at that failure or that breach by Adam and Eve. In chapter 3 of Genesis, we're going to look at verse 6. Now, man and woman, they're already created, and they're in this lavish, beautiful garden. And verse 6 says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. Now, this is the tree that they were not supposed to eat from. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. And it says, then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig, leaf, the fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Now, you might say, what a simple matter that caused the whole fall of humanity. Come on, eating from a tree? You might say, how simple is that? I mean, look at all that's happened in the world, all the death and carnage. And I would say to you that any transgression, it doesn't no matter what it is, any transgression is reprehensible and unacceptable to a holy God or the holy God. You might also ask them, how can any of us be good enough to enter heaven? And I would say, I'm glad you asked, because we could never be good enough. That's why it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, now you can turn there with me. I'm going to pause for a minute, and then I'm going to read from verse 21. But I, if you don't want to, you can just listen to what it says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. It says this, because the question is, can anybody be good enough? The answer is no. It's no. It says God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So the answer to the question, could anybody be good enough? No. That's why God had to make him, Jesus, who knew absolutely no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. So your question is a really good question because if eating from that fruit or that tree caused the whole carnage of mankind that we have seen throughout the ages, if that's it, then that tells you how holy God must be. That all sin is unacceptable to the holy God. Sin is not acceptable to God in any way, shape, matter, or form. So in order to please God, something else had to happen. And we're going to read about that in just a moment. But Adam set in motion the curse of death. As it says, when you eat from this tree, you will surely die. He set in motion the curse 
of death when he ate from that tree. Therefore, all men die. The first record of death and the shedding of blood soon follows when God fashions clothing or a covering for Adam and Eve. Now, listen to what it says. You can also turn with me to Genesis 3, 21. I'll slow down just so you can turn there if you want to. Genesis 3, 21. It says this. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and Eve and his wife and clothed them. So what God had to do to cover their shame and their nakedness was to clothe them, to clothe them. But he did it with the skin of animals. Therefore, something had to die in order for God to be in their presence. Remember, they had sinned and God had to fashion clothing for them or covering for them, which is going to be the real story of the Bible, that the shedding of blood is going to have to take place in order for you and I to enter heaven. The Bible says this, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So blood will have to be shed. And the first blood shed on planet Earth after creation was when God had to fashion clothing for Adam and Eve because they sinned in the garden. But now in the same chapter, chapter three of Genesis, verse seven, back up a little and read with me there. Genesis 3, seven, it says Adam and Eve clothed themselves with fig leaves. See, that was their attempt to cover their nakedness. God is saying something deeper, and that is sin has to be atoned for by the shedding of blood. No matter how you try to cover your sin, it will never be covered enough that you would be seen blameless and holy in the eyes of God. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. At that point, man's innocence and paradise was lost. In that same chapter of Genesis, chapter 3, we'll pick up in verse 22. And it says, And the Lord God said, The man who has now become one of us, knowing good and evil, he must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. It says, So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. I mean, that sounds like a very simple story, it may even sound like a fairy tale, but it brought death on all of mankind. And now we live in a world where there's so much harm and there's so much damage and there's so much carnage. But it all began right there 6,000 years ago when Adam and Eve broke the command of the Lord in the garden. And now he said, when you do this, you will surely die. What does Hebrews 9 say in verse 27? It says, it is now appointed to once for man to die. And after that, the judgment, every man dies now based on what Adam and Eve did in the garden. Now, remember, I just told you that the Bible is interconnected. It's really one story. The Old Testament and the New. I'm going to jump ahead real quick to make a point with you. What Adam did in the Old Testament, Jesus would undo in the New Testament. Turn with me to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, remember the Old Testament and the New, they're really one book, two testaments. One book, two testaments. Now, what was done in the Old Testament? The fall. Jesus would later correct or remedy in the New Testament. And look at what Paul says about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll start in verse 21. It says, For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come. When he hands over the kingdom of God, the Father, and after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power, for he must reign until he puts all of his enemies under his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed 
is death. You see the interconnectivity of the old and new. In the Old Testament, Adam, he failed us all. But we're not going to just point the finger at Adam. But he failed us all. And now Jesus is the solution, the only answer to remedy what Adam did in the garden. His attempt to cover himself with fig leaves was not enough. The same is true for you and for me. Trying to cover over our sin in any way, thinking that we're good enough just because we're better than the next guy, at least in our own eyes, is still not good enough. God, he killed animals and clothed them. Those animals had to die for their nakedness to be covered. And Jesus, it says, is the innocent one, the sinless one, who's going to die and pay for our sin. And therefore, he's going to be that covering that Adam and Eve exposed in the garden. The verses I just read to you basically tell the story of humanity. We are living sandwiched in between the fall of man and the curse. And then comes the reverse of the curse where Jesus destroys everything that Satan did in the or Adam failed to do in the garden. But the stage is now set for an epic battle. The fall in the garden was satanically inspired. And so we are sandwiched in between right now. An epic battle. We are in the middle of a beginning and the eventual end that is to come. But in the meantime, we're trying to lead people and teach people to understand that there's nothing they can do to save themselves from this eternal separation from God that is to come. That's why we teach the Bible, the word of God. That is why it's important for you to know the word of God, because it is appointed to man once to die. After that, the judgment, there is no second bite at the apple. It's done. When we die, is there anybody who believes they're going to live forever in this body? Absolutely not. If you do believe that, you're foolish. So since all men are going to die, that started somewhere and it started with Adam in the Garden of Eden. And now we all need that covering, the blood of Jesus Christ. The fall in the garden was satanically inspired. And you know, the offense actually occurred by Satan's influence. At that point, paradise was lost. But God made a promise that in that same chapter that he was going to restore what was lost on that day. Here's what Genesis 3, 14 says. Turn there with me. And by the way, if you're not turning there, at least write the scriptures down because I need you to go back and read it. I need you to stop the video and let's see, let's compare notes together. But let's do whatever it takes to get an understanding of what we're dealing with right now. In Genesis chapter three, beginning at verse 14, it says, so the Lord God said to the serpent who led them into sin, because you've done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Another way of looking at it is a battle is going to occur, occur one day, and the damage will be inflicted to both parties. But there will be a decisive winner, the one who crushes the head. The cross won the victory, but the battle continues. The dominion of Satan is still in operation. It's still ongoing. And death is the last enemy, as we read in 1 Corinthians 15, the last enemy to be destroyed. But the Bible teaches us that even though Christ has died for our sins and he is our righteousness, his shed blood paid for our iniquities. The Bible still says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and spiritual wickedness in the heavenly realm. So even though we're saved, there's still this ongoing battle. Satan is not completely destroyed yet, or he has not been thrown into the eternal lake of fire yet. So we're in an ongoing battle in the heavenly realm. We're not fighting against each other, but we're in a battle in the heavenly realms against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, 
me give you a picture of what that looks like in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. If you don't mind, turn there and we're going to read what that says. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we're going to pick up in verse 4. And this is to give you a picture of the ongoing work of the enemy, Satan. He started it in the garden and he's continuing it this day. Now, let me show you how he operates. In 2 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse 4, it says this. The God of this age, meaning Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel. You see that? That displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. It says, for we, us, preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Jesus Christ. I think that is a very powerful passage. Listen, the God of this world, Satan, blinds the minds of unbelievers that they cannot see the light and the glory of the Lord's Christ. Here's what that looks like. You talk about Jesus to someone or you minister to someone and it sounds like gibberish to them. That means Satan is blinding their eyes. Jesus defeated him on the cross, but he's still at work until this final day of, of reckoning comes. So he blinds the minds of unbelievers that they cannot see the light of the gospel. At one time, your eyes were covered and you couldn't see it. But the same God who says to darkness, let there be light. The same God caused that light to shine in your heart one day and you were able to see the glory of God. You were able to see at that moment that you need a savior, that you're a sinner. I'm a sinner, but God has pro provided a sacrifice that we might know Jesus Christ and know him as Lord and our sins be covered by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ breaks the back of the curse caused by Adam in the garden. It is the gospel and the acceptance of the gospel of Jesus Christ, accepting him into your heart is what breaks the back of the curse that began in the garden. Now, our job now is to destroy the work of Satan. It is to destroy anything that he does. We're all about destroying his work. The central theme and most important theme of Christianity is to exalt the name of Jesus. That is the point of Christianity, to exalt the name of Jesus. Why? Because he's the one that won the victory. Now, I know this is elementary to a lot of you, but it's so vital and it's so important that this remains in the forefront of our understanding that we could never be good enough. That one who had no sin had to become sin for us. That someone, the son of the living God, whom Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And so when you're in church or when you visit churches or you've watched churches on television before you used to go, and now that you do go, the main theme of all that we're doing with all the singing and all the preaching and all the teaching, the main theme is to glorify God. That is what it's all about. Lifting up the name of Jesus. And here's why. In Philippians chapter 2, here's what it says. And I'm only going to read a part of it. But I want you to turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. And I'm just going to pick up in verse 8. Because this is incredible. Because when you read this, you have to think about it for the reality that the Bible teaches that it is. It says, being found in the appearance as a man. That is not a small matter. Who was found in the appearance as a man? God, the Son, became a man. That is not just a guy. It's saying he being found in the appearance as a man, God himself, God the son became a man. He took on a body, not for himself, but for us. Now, again, you say, or you might think that simply eating from a tree is, has brought all of this upon us. It's right. That's right. That's what happened. And you might say that's too small. But it also should tell you how holy God is. And that sin will never enter his presence. 
Never. Never. So in order to atone for what he did, it says, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death. Who? God, the son. Even death on a cross, who died on the cross? God, the son. The shameful death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. In heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. Wow. Wow. Today, I just wanted to lay a foundation. Today, I wanted to just reiterate things that we already know. That you can never be good enough. I could never be good enough on my own. Therefore, we all needed a savior. What Adam did in the garden affected all of us. Adam ate from the tree that God had absolutely forbidden him from eating from. And so did Eve. And when they did that, as God said, which God is not a man that he should lie. When God said, when you do this, you will surely die. We are living testimonies that that scripture came to pass when they ate from that tree because all men die. But immediately, God provided a remedy in that same chapter, in that same book. He says, I'm going to send one born of the seed of a woman. And he's going to be your adversary, Satan. Yes, you are going to strike his heel but he's going to crush your head. He's going to, Jesus is going to win us back. Remember, I said, they made clothing for themselves when they realized, when they had eaten from that tree, they realized their nakedness and they covered themselves. You understand that you wear clothing everywhere. You want to be modest. You, you want your body to be covered. There are parts that you don't want seen. Well, it exposed their sin when they ate from that tree and they tried to cover themselves. It didn't work and it doesn't work today. So here's what happened. God says in order for your nakedness to be covered, this is what I'm going to have to do. I'm going to have to kill an innocent animal, an innocent animal and put his skins over you. But it's only going to be temporary. It's only going to be for a time. But that's going to be your covering. And it's also telling you of a deeper reality that is to come. That one day, ultimately, all of your sins are going to have to be atoned for. Every last one of them. Because I, the Lord, am holy. So all of our sin is going to need to be covered over. But a sinner, another sinner cannot pay for your sin. Remember, we're talking about a holy God. In order to atone for your sin the holy God would have to send God the Son who is holy to die in your place and to die in my place. There's our foundation. There's our, uh, let's just say, beginning point. And I've got a couple more videos that I want to do that's going to lead us up to the book of Acts. But I want to have us all on the same page in this way. I want everybody to understand why the rest of the Bible is important. You have to understand what happened in order for you to appreciate what God would later do. Why do we all call ourselves sinners? Because we are, but where did it begin? It began with Adam. Well, how is God gonna fix it? He did in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross. But there are still enemies out there. Satan still has a realm or a dominion that he operates in, and he blinds the minds of people so they can't see the light of God's gospel. We're living in a very lost and blind world right now. 
And you know what that's like because the light came on in your life one day and all of a sudden you recognize your nakedness. You said, I'm a sinner. All of those things that I used to do that I kind of gave myself a pass on, they're not that bad. Well, you realize they are in the eyes of God. And you realize that there was nothing you could ever do to rid yourself of them. Not only did God take away the guilt or the sin itself, he took away the guilt and the shame. What does that mean? That means that you don't have to carry it around anymore, even in your thoughts, in your minds. Some of those things that we did, it hurts. But God has said, you are free indeed, completely. You mean I can live as though I never did those things? That's exactly what he means. You know, the things that I can make right with people that I've harmed in the past, I try to make it right. If I can go back and fix something myself, I'll do it. I don't want to act like, nah, 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 I got away with it. That's not the point. The point is, is that in the eyes of God, you're made righteous through the shed blood of his son. But anything that we could do to make things right with people, you know what? Let's do it. Let's do it just because it's right. Because that's who we are. We're Christians. We want to do what's right. Now, in my next video, I'm going to start with how we, how I came to the conclusion that this occurred 6,000 years ago. Now, we've talked, or you, there are all kinds of theories out there of millions and billions of years. I'm simply going to use scripture as I read it and the math mathematical genius that God gave people to come to a conclusion that we know of that says we're in the year of our Lord 2020. Why do you say that? There's a reason why you say we're in the year of our Lord 2020. What did you, what did your clock start? How did you get to that conclusion that, and how about this? What year were you born? Whatever year that was, I'm not going to tell you when I was born. Every time I go and do something now and they want my age down on the computer, I'm running out of space to find out where my age, uh, my birthday is or the birth year. Some of you kids, you're born in the in the late 1900s or early 2000s. I got to go back a ways, but that's OK. My only other option was not a good option. So. I don't mind being the age I am considering the options. So I want you to understand this, that you get those dates from somewhere and we're going to take a look at it. We're going to look at it from a biblical perspective. You're going to say there are other ways of measuring time. And OK, let's look at that, too. In fact, we grew up being taught certain things in the Bible um, about time and a lot of different things that we learned as children and then kids go off to college and they come back totally different people because of the other theologies and the other schools of thought that are out there. I believe the Bible is the final authority on everything. Let me throw out two terms for you real quick and then I'm going to close us in prayer. Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone, is what we base all of our theology on. If something disagrees with scripture, then that other thing has to be wrong. The other one is scriptura. Here, let me get this right. Sub scientia. Scriptura sub scientia. What does that mean? That means there are those who subordinate scripture to science. Scriptura sub scientia. Well, I'm not one of those. Scripture above science, the others, science above scripture. I'm not one of those, the latter. I believe that scripture trumps everything. So you know what? Thank you for being a part. I'm looking forward to our journey together and all the things that we're going to talk about. The topics will be many, and I mean many. And I'm excited right now. It 
probably showed in the beginning, I was very anxious to do this because I just want to enjoy this with you together. And if you disagree, I'm going to even give you an opportunity to give me some feedback. But I want us to enjoy the Word of God. I gave you a lot of scriptures today and a lot to digest, and I would love it if you would read them. I'm on the clock. I have a X amount of time to do this, but I purposely gave you the scriptures so you could go back and read them yourself. But I'm going to continue to lay a foundation, and we're going to grow in the knowledge of God. And then we're going to get to the book of Acts. And we're going to have a great time together. So would you bow your heads? Thank you for, for joining us. Would you bow your heads? Father, in Jesus' name, I just ask you, Lord, to just build a bond between us. And Father, help me to be as clear as possible and be able to speed up and slow down as need be so that, Lord, we can break this bread together and and dine on it, Lord, and digest it. I pray, Father, that we would just build this bond that week to week people will sit down in front of their computers or television and we just do this together. And so, God, thank you. Lord, and bless your sons and daughters, everyone who sees this video. Bless them mightily and richly in Jesus' name. Amen.